This lesson deals with a two-stage differential amplifier with current source biasing. You can find these notes in the ECE302 ebook in chapter 6, starting on page 10. What's shown here is a schematic of a differential amplifier that has two stages. Here's one stage and here's another one. This is going to give us a lot more gain because we have two transistors now instead of a single transistor. And the circuitry down here is going to create a constant current. We're going to use that current to bias these four transistors. Assume that all these transistors are made on the same piece of silicon, so they're all identical, and that their beta f is very large. And then based on the application note that this came from, which is a Motorola application note number 204, they suggested that VBE on and VD on is around 0.7 volts. So we'll use that and see what we get as results. I'd like to find V out too. Scroll back up here, show you where that is. Find this voltage here, which will have an AC and a DC component to it. I'm going to use beta f of 50 when I actually do the calculation for the AC gain. Well, I'm going to use beta f as a very large number when I do the DC biasing. I'll explain this in the next few slides. We'll analyze this amplifier with our four-step procedure that we use in other amplifiers. And the first step is to assume that we're in the active region, and then we'll find the DC operating point. We're going to set all the independent sources equal to zero, and that was our AC inputs that were here and here. And I'm just going to label things on the schematic and not put a model in. I introduced an idea that if you had a fairly complicated circuit, you could roughly approximate the collector and emitter current by making an assumption that beta f was a super big number, in other words, approaching infinity. And when that occurred, the base current was shrinking to zero. That would make the collector and emitter current equal to each other. Let's try these ideas on the schematic. I've labeled these as step A. We'll label the base emitter drop. So here's transistor 2, transistor 6, transistor 7, transistor 4, and transistor 3, and diodes 1 and 2. Let's label it the base current is small. Here's my base currents for 2 and 6 and 7 and 4. I'll say they're approximately equal to 0. And then likewise for transistor 3. That's going to make the collector and emitter currents equal to each other. So here's the collector of 2, same as the emitter of 2. Here's the collector of 7, roughly equal to the emitter of 7. Here's the collector of 3, roughly equal to the emitter of 3. We have this set equal to 0 and this set equal to 0. So we've got these two base emitter junctions of 2 and 4 hardwired together. It's going to make their collector currents identical. It's going to make their base currents identical and the collector emitter voltage is identical. So the current in transistor 2 is the same as the current in transistor 4. Same is true for transistor 7. That would be the same as the collector current here. Now there's a missing resistor here. I'll talk some more about this towards the end of the video. But the reason these collector currents are the same is because the voltages across these base emitter junctions are the same. In other words, this point is hardwired together. And this other point over here, if we have identical collector currents here, then we'll create the same drops as you go back to the 6 volts. We have the same voltage across these two base emitters because of how they're wired together. Let's start over here, step I'll call step B. I'm going to label this current I sub X. So the current I sub X entering here, but we're assuming that this base current is very small, so all that current goes down here. I could write a loop equation around here and solve for the current I sub X. Let's let me calculate eventually this collector current here. Let's go around the loop would be I sub X times 3.2 K. The drop is 0.7 plus 0.7, that's 1.4. And then 1.5 K times I sub X and then minus six, we're back to ground. And that's this equation right over here. Put this on the other side of the equation as a plus six minus 1.4, divide by 3.2 K and divide by 1.5 K, added together. And that's the value of I sub X. And that's a little bit less than a milliamp, 978.7 microamps. And now know this current. I can use that to go around this loop over here and solve for the voltage across this element and eventually get the current. The drop across here would be in this direction, and that would be I sub C3 times 2.2K. The rise in voltage would equal the drops around the loop, equal to minus 0.7, plus 0.7, plus 0.7, plus, 0.7, plus I sub X times 1.5K, and we come back around the loop. These two 0.7s cancel each other. Now solve for I sub C3. It's going to be equal to 0.7 plus I sub X, which is 978.8 micro, times 1.5 K divided by 2.2 K. And that turns out to be a similar number of 985.5 microamps. Now I know this emitter current, which is roughly the same as the collector current, which is the value up here. As these are hardwired together, their collector currents are identical. Current splits in half, half goes here and half goes here. So half that current that we just calculated is 492.8 microamps. So half this current goes here and half the current goes here, and that's going to be the same as this current. And if nothing goes here, that's the same as the current in here. The value of 492.8 microamps. I go around this loop like this. I know everything but I sub C7, so I could solve for that current. 
6 volts is equal to 7.75K times this current of 492.8 micro plus 0.7. And then the current in here is going to be I sub C7 plus I sub C7 times 1.5K. This is the equation over here. We can now solve for I sub C7. We've got 6 minus 0.7. And minus this term right here, and we're going to divide by 2 times 1.5k, my value of I sub C7, that's about 493.6 microamps. Lastly, then I can solve for V out if I know the value of I sub C7. C7 causes a drop across the 3k resistor, so this voltage back to ground is minus this drop plus 6. Minus I sub C7 times 3k plus 6 would equal V out 2 for DC value. That's the equation on the bottom of the page right here. So this current is 493.6 micro and it gives me 4.519 volts. I have a DC level at my output voltage and then we're going to calculate the AC signal and we're going to add the two together if the signal is small enough. Again note here I didn't put any models in for the diodes of the transistor but just simply label the facts about the transistor right on the schematic. This technique that we use of ignoring base current is a quick way to estimate a BJT circuit, but it's a good idea to check that that was a reasonable approximation. To do that, we need to assume a value of beta f that isn't infinite, and maybe more reasonable, say like 50. So let's go back and find our base currents and see if that was a reasonable approximation to throw those away. For transistors 2 and 4, they had the same collector current of 492.8 microamps, so dividing that by 50, I get about 10 microamps. 6 and 7 was 493.6 micro, Dividing that by 50 is again around 10 microamps. I sub C3 was 985.5. If we divide that by 50, we get 19.71 microamps, around 20 microamps. Let's go look at our schematic and see whether when we ignore those base currents that that was a reasonable approximation. Transistors 2 and 6, we found that this current was 492.8 micro from the bottom circuit, and we assume that this was the same as this one. But there is a current going in here. We just solved for that to being 9.872 microamps. Is this much, much smaller than this? If it is, it was a reasonable approximation. This number is about 50 times bigger than this one, so yeah, it was a reasonable approximation. It's going to give us an error, but not a big one. Likewise, for transistor 3, we found that the base current, if we use a beta f of 50, based on the current that was here, was 19.71 microamps. The current that was coming in here, we found to be 978.7 microamps, and we ignored this and just put the same value down here. How does this compare to this? 19.71 is much, much smaller than 978.7 microamps by about a factor of 50. And so those are reasonable approximations. We show that the base currents were positive for our transistors, and so that's just half of the things we need to check to be in the active region. The second is the collector emitter voltage. Let's go solve for those and see if they're bigger than a few hundred millivolts. Now to do that, let me go back to page 11, and I'll show where these equations came from, and then we'll evaluate them. The collector emitter voltage for transistor 2 and transistor 4 are the same. Let's see if we can solve for this. What's well, going to be this node voltage minus this node voltage. This node voltage is going to be equal to minus this collector current IC2 times 7.75K plus 6 volts back to ground. And then this node voltage is minus 0.7. We'll go back to page 13 just shortly. For transistor 6, which is over here, we're going to have a slightly different voltage than for transistor 7 because this resistor is set equal to 0. The voltage across this transistor's collector emitter is going to be this node voltage, which is 6, minus this node voltage. I can just go around the loop this way because I solve for the voltage across here. It's going to be 6 volts minus the quantity of minus 0.7 plus VCE2 minus 0.7. The difference of those two node voltages. Next, let's solve for the collector emitter voltage of transistor 7. So I just go around the loop this way and solve for this voltage. So the rise in voltage here is the collector emitter of transistor 7, and that's equal to minus I sub C7 times 3K plus the collector emitter voltage of transistor 6. And last, let's get transistor 3. Here's our collector emitter voltage. This node voltage is equal to minus 0.7, and then this node voltage here, we can calculate, as the drop across here of 2.2K times I sub C3, and then minus 6. We're going to take those two voltages and put them together and then subtract their summation. That difference will be the voltage across the collector emitter of transistor 3. Let's go back to page 13. Here's the equation for 2 and 4. And we have the collector current of 2, which was 492.8 micro. And that turns out to be 2.8808 volts. So much, much greater than a few hundred millivolts. For transistor 6, we had 6 minus the quantity of, of minus 0.7 plus VCE2 minus 0.7. That's going to give me a plus 0.7 here and a plus 0.7 here and then a minus 0.7. 
the collector emitter voltage we just found of 2.8808, and that gives me 4.5192, much greater than a couple hundred millivolts. For transistor 7, we had the collector current times the 3K resistor, and then the collector emitter voltage of 6. This was 493.6 micro, and adding that to the 4.5192 we just found, we get 3.0384 much, much greater than a few hundred millivolts, so that checks. And for transistor three, we had the difference of minus 0.7 with this quantity of IC3 times 2.2K minus six. This was 985.5 micro, and that gives me a 3.1319 value of voltage for the collector emitter voltage of transistor three. Our base currents are all positive, they're small, and the collector emitter voltages are way greater than a couple hundred millivolts. So our assumption that we're in the active region checks. We found the collector current of transistor three, and it was independent of the transistors that are above it. It's really driven by this circuit over here. What we're doing is we're forcing a voltage across this resistor. This is acting like a constant current, and we could model that just as a current source of the value of that collector current of 985.5 microamps. Now, when we do the AC analysis, we're gonna set all our DC sources equal to zero. For a voltage source, we would short circuit it, but for a current source, the AC resistance would be the change in voltage over the change in current. The change in current now is zero because we have a constant current for a current source, but there can be a change in voltage across it because of this collector emitter drop. It looks like something divided by zero, in other words, an open circuit. We short circuit DC batteries for AC, we're gonna open circuit DC current sources. Step two of our algorithm is to calculate the AC model. We'll need a finite value for beta F to do this. In the application note from Motorola, they were suggesting that beta F was 50, so we'll again use that value as we did previously, and we'll assume that eta F for silica is about one. Our value, because of symmetry, for, for R pi two and R pi four, would be eta F e sub t over I sub b at the Q point, and that was gonna be one times 26 millivolts divided by 9.856 microamps. That's 2.64K. Our AC and DC betas will be the same, and they were equal to 50. Next, for calculating R pi six and seven, we're gonna use A to F E sub T over I sub B for transistor six or seven, because they were equal, and that was 9.872 microamps, and that gives me 2.63K. And the AC and DC beta will be the same value of 50. Transistor three on the bottom, we could put a model in it and solve for its AC resistance, but we already argued that a DC current source is an open circuit for AC. Step three is to find the AC results. So we're gonna put the AC model in for each component. Here's our plus power supply, here's our minus power supply, and here's our two AC inputs, in one and in two. And then we're gonna put our AC model in for each transistor, so between the base and emitter and R pi, the appropriate subscript, and between the collector and emitter of beta F, I sub B, with again the appropriate subscripts for transistor two, transistor six, transistor seven, and transistor four. We're solving for V out two, which is actually a node voltage back to ground, and that's gonna be equal to the current that flows in here, which is beta F7 times IB7 times 3K. So it's a minus because I have a negative terminal back to ground, but that's what I'm solving for. But this circuit isn't symmetric. It's almost symmetric, but this doesn't look the same as this. What I could do is find an equivalent circuit of this that is symmetric, analyze it using Bartlett's bisection theorem, and then come back and use this formula to find the output voltage for AC signals. So I'm gonna do that is to draw this resistor twice to make this thing symmetric on this side and this side. I'm gonna put a short circuit here because anything in series with a current source doesn't change the current source value. So if I make this a short circuit, then these two halves look the same. This was on the next page. By shorting this resistor and doubling the value of the resistor I had before, which is 1.5K, I now can draw this in two symmetrical boxes. Let's find the differential gain. I'll do it for the right-hand circuit. I'll replace this by the differential mode over two plus the common mode and then set the common mode equal to zero. I'm gonna short the common wires that are here and then analyze the circuit. Now let's redraw this because this short is actually shorting this out and these two points are connected together. We've got VID over two coming in here with an R pi back to ground. I have this current source beta F IB4 back to ground. I then have the resistor R pi seven, which is 2.63K. That's this resistor here going back to ground. And then I've got this 7.75K back to ground. And then I've got this current source shorted on both sides, so it's not gonna have any effect to find the current that's in IB7. Let's analyze the circuit. The current that's flowing in here is the base current of transistor seven due to the first source, I'll use a prime. And that's related to this current that's over here with a current divider. With the current in this resistor, it's gonna be the other resistor over the sum of the two times the current that's coming in, which is beta F4 times IB4 prime, and beta F4 was equal to 50. 
We did this back in ECE201. If you want to go back and look at that derivation for a current divider with two resistors in parallel. This gives me 7.75K over 10.38K. And then I sub B4 prime is going to be equal to this voltage, which is VID over 2, divided by R pi 4, which is 2.64K. Here's my 50, and then here's my value of I sub B4 prime. That turns out to be a minus 7.07 milli times VID. The input resistance for this circuit is just simply R pi 4. You can use that to find our differential input resistance, and we'll do that on the final page of the video. Next is the common mode gain. We'll take our input signal, which was VID over 2, plus V sub IC, and set the VID over 2 equal to 0. So we just have the common mode voltage here. And then our common wires are just cut. They have no current flowing in them. We just disconnect them, and we analyze that half circuit. The current that's going out here is 0, but the current that's coming in are the sum of these two currents. IB4 double prime plus beta F4 times IB4 double prime has to equal 0. I'm adding two numbers together that have an IB4 in it, and that has to add up to zero. The only number that works is zero. That current is zero, and that's going to make the input resistance of the half circuit just equal to an open circuit or infinity. I'm going to solve for IB7 double prime, and that's going to be just going around a loop, say, over here that has IB7 double prime in it. We start at ground and we work our way back to ground. Since this current is zero, the current in here is IB7 double prime. That times 7.75K plus I sub B 7 double prime times r pi 7 plus the current in here which is beta f 7 plus 1 times ib 7 double prime times 3k has to all add up to zero but again here i've got ib 7 double prime in every term again i'm adding all these together and the only number that works is zero the value for ib 7 double prime is zero now we can add the results for ib 7 we're going to use that to find our ac output voltage which we showed previously as minus beta F7 times IB7 times 3K. But this is zero, so we just have the value from the differential mode, which we found to be minus 7.07 .07 milli times V sub ID. Multiply that by 50, and multiply that by 3K. Minus signs cancel, we get a plus, and the product of these three is 1,061 times V sub ID. Our output voltage in step four is the sum of our DC plus AC results. We found that the DC voltage at Node 2 is 4.519, and now the AC voltage is the differential signal times a gain of around 1,000. Of course, our differential signal was the number 2 input minus the number 1 input. We're going to hook this up to another couple more stages and create an op amp in the next video. Our differential input resistance was twice R pi 4, and that's be 5.28K. And our common mode resistance is half of the half circuit, but that was infinity, so it's still equal to an open circuit. One more thing, let's go back to page 14. When we did the AC analysis, we put an AC model in for every component that's here, and we created this sort of a pseudo-symmetric circuit that was almost symmetric except for this short circuit that was here. We did figure out the output voltage using symmetry and equivalent circuits because anything in series with a current source has no effect, but why do they leave this thing out? Well, it turns out a resistor takes a certain amount of space on an integrated circuit, and the cost of the integrated circuit depends on the final size of the IC. So if you don't need something, leaving it off just made the chip smaller. And this is the analysis of a two-stage differential amplifier with current source biasing.